So this is episode 363. Um, anyone that's been following along with what we've done here over the last nine or 10 years here um, has got to know, I think, us, get to know the brand. And what has been happening here recently has been very uncharacteristic of everyone here at Exodus. And um, there's been inklings and, and people have reached out asking what's the health of Exodus and where are we at? And unfortunately, uh, we're going to be closing our doors um, this in the next three weeks before the end of the year. And that's exceptionally hard to say out loud. And I know that there's going to be a lot of different emotions on this podcast. And also I'm sure as the listeners to this, like you guys have bought into what we've done, you, you believed in our mission and ultimately from a lot of outside forces, we haven't been able to deliver what we want and know we could. And ultimately, you know, we'll dive into everything. And the goal of this is to be completely transparent. That's what we've been in the past. And we haven't been transparent because we've been working exceptionally hard to avoid this exact conversation. Yeah. And we've pushed it off a little bit longer than probably what we should have because we've been working fanatically to get this resolved. And at this rate, we've basically exhausted every possible resource and avenue. So it's an extremely uh, tough podcast here, but we owe it to you guys. And uh, usually we're, we're talking about stuff that's a lot more fun, but I just know that a lot of people will tune in this and uh, there'll be some people that are pissed off, which I understand. And there'll be people that may have an ounce of empathy that we've all worked exceptionally hard and this is not the end that none of us wanted. So that's to preface this episode and I'll pass it off. Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, that's a good general overview that I'll add that there might be some added light at the end of the tunnel, possibly uh, that we're continuing to, to, to work through as we speak today. Um, but I think the, you know, the mission of this podcast is to walk through what we've done over 10 years to discuss how, why, how, and why we're in this situation in depth. Um, and what that means to all of our customers, essentially to use this as a vessel to communicate what is going to happen with your devices as far as connected devices, um, what that means to you guys. Um, and Unfortunately, everybody here is impacted at in some capacity, whether you're uh, a business owner, an Exodus employee, uh, a consumer of our products or a consumer of our content. Like it's, it's kind of everybody that's listening to this episode is infected, affected one way or, or the next. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot to cover here and I'm trying to think of the best way to explain everyone to to what we ha have going on here i mean i think that you know over the i mean this business was you started this business bootstrapped it and we have w collectively worked exceptionally hard to get it to where it was at or where yeah. it's at today and you know there's as a business grows or it's like we faced a variety of major struggles throughout the years and every time we figure out a way to overcome it um whether that's when right when you started it like in 2018 that was an exceptionally hard time and we knuckled down and this outworked it and got it to where the business was growing 2022 business was growing exceptionally fast and you know the market changes and we had to change with the market and this is bigger bets and the other thing to this i mean i have pounded every single door i possibly could think of and doors i shouldn't pound it on in order to try to rectify this and avoid this exact scenario and what's been most interesting with doing that is other manufacturers, trail camera manufacturers, other former business owners that had dealt with overseas manufacturing. Every one of them had said that they had faced something very similar and they either had the resources or caught a lucky bounce. And they all said that easily could have been, it could have been us. And whether they're saying that to be nice or not, I do believe it because um, just like some of the conversations we've had with some of those folks, it's like, it's ruthless. And I know myself as a consumer, <laughs> My consumer purchasing behavior will forever be changed uh, with what uh, we've experienced and um, ultimately like unfair, unjust, unethical, um, and ultimately it impacts all of our customers, which I carry a lot, like it really bothers me. Yeah, no, I think there's a valid point there about con your, our personal consumer behavior changing because of what we've went through over the last 18 months. And there's a there's a plethora, plethora of things to basically unpack there, which we'll ultimately get to. Um, but to your point, it seems as though uh, the majority of business owners that we've talked to have faced the same exact challenges 
that we faced over the last 18 months um, in some magnitude, right? Maybe at scale, their problem was a little bit bigger, but ultimately they had the resources to pivot from that and um, move forward where, uh, you know, I guess ultimately we did not have the resources to, to make the pivots in time. But to your point, it wasn't because of lack of effort, which I think one thing that the three of us could probably look back at the last decade um, and, it, and maybe I'm not, I shouldn't speak for, for you guys, but for me personally, like hard work does not guarantee you success every time. Like there are, there are certain things in life that you can outwork people in. And my, that's my mentality. That's the only way I've ever been successful. It's just, a, Hey, my shoulders are broad. I am put on this earth to suffer more than others. Put the burden on me and I'll outwork anybody. But ultimately in this situation, that was not enough. Yeah. And so, I, mean, I think it probably just makes sense to give some clarity on what customers have been experiencing. And I think that, you know, I mean, I'll let you jump in wherever, where, however far back you want to go, but, um, I, I, well, let's start here. I think right now, over the last couple of months, there's been a narrative, right? Like through social, through customers and people from the outside looking in, they see us release an app, right? The app was a couple months late. Uh, we had some onboarding problems with that migration process. And then we've had people or customers have problems with physical products that they have not had in the past. And the one new thing added into that equation is the app. So and a lot of people are looking at this saying, well, the app's a piece of crap. My cameras don't work because of the app, the app's garbage, et cetera, et cetera. That narrative is not true at all like we do not have or did not have a problem with the app we are having or have problems with physical products based around firmware like so you can the the physical products that people have now that uh for instance the exodus render um not staying connected or the problems that they are having are not a physical product uh hardware situation it is dependent on the folks writing the firmware uh if, if that makes sense so uh, again uh, there's there's a lot more to unpack there but i want to make sure that the narrative that people are pushing is the failure is not coming from us developing an app yes that's like that's part of the financial burden that has been placed on our shoulders was the um the investment made there but the root cause of us going out of business and the problems people are experiencing, it's not app related. It's a, it's related to the physical product. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Uh, very important to bring that up because I mean, as we close our doors, you're, you're going to need to migrate back to scout tech and you're going to need to email them at support at scout .com. And same, very similar process to what you guys have already done once. Uh, let them know what sims you need. So if you have the render, you're going to need Verizon sims. If you have the rival, you're going to need AT and T sims, and they'll send you the instructions for the firmware. And I mean, prior to the migration, the render worked exceptionally well, and it's going to continue to exceptionally work well. The rival is going to keep working great, and so that's important to bring up right off the right off the bat in case we lose anyone. That's that's your next step as a customer as of today. Yeah, I think before we get into the depths of those scenarios which we will communicate um for lack of better words let's go ahead and follow like the things that we had talked about pre-recording like talking about the 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 milestones the beginnings and then the struggles that uh we've kind of faced over the last 18 months into the decision to go ahead and, and develop an app and then the struggles within the last 14 months that have ultimately created the the burden of us uh, dissolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the, I mean, Exodus was, was started for, uh, uh, to build quality products at an affordable price with unmatched customer service. And that was kind of the, one of the main pillars of the business for a very long time. And we grew this business in kind of the D to C boom of around COVID pre COVID post COVID. And that whole segment has really matured since then. Uh, but we were able to be part of a really cool opportunity in the world of the internet and grow this podcast, grow the YouTube channel, and really build a voice for whitetail hunters, regardless of what camera you had used, and to simply educate people and have 
but I feel is a, one of the better media platforms for whitetail hunting in the space that we had built brick by brick, episode by episode, nothing fancy, extremely small team, extremely talented team, but extremely small team and did it. I mean, with, with very, very little resources, it was hopping in a truck, driving everywhere, recording the podcast. I mean, doing, I mean, doing a lot of stuff that other people won't. Um, and I, I think that was, I mean, it was really fun actually. <laughs> like I have hard to be like looking forward, like in the future of whatever happens, like part of me will certainly miss that. Um, in, in a lot of ways. And a lot of the things too, is like we earned our customers one by one. They went to our website, bought our products. They didn't go to the store and just thought it was a cool logo or thought it was a cool camera or bought it on a whim. They bought it because they believed in what we had to say and, or whether it was a friend that told another friend that these cameras are great. And so, I mean, throughout that process, like we truly built and had some contact with every single customer along the way. Yeah. I think, you know, right now we have, we're probably in a, a valley of emotion. Like we're at the bottom. Right. Um, but there's also a peak to that in that you're speaking to, to be proud of. I mean, we started, I started the company with my brother and, and, and Matt Klein with $59,000 and bootstrapped this thing completely self-taught top to bottom. And Jake, to your point, like there were a plethora of roadblocks going from buying out previous co-founders, going through M and a discussions, uh, scaling the business, taking on, I mean, there's just, there's probably too many things to talk about in a, in this specific podcast that's maybe not totally relevant to end users. Um, but I guess my, my point there is like, this isn't from a lack of lack of effort or lack of trying no one here um is walking out like with their pockets full of cash like that is exact there's opposite. a burden it is the exact opposite um and this is the last thing that we wanted to happen but here we are yeah for sure and i think that's i mean whether people care or not and i guess they don't have to care one way or the other but it's like they you don't. have the you have the time of what the time, effort, and energy to build the brand. And obviously as some, at the end of the road, like you, you think of, uh, you know, there might be a payoff for this. Like no one would, no one fan, would fanatically have done what we've done if you knew how it ended this way. No. And I think that it, like losing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, like uh, investors not getting what they thought, like everyone took a calculated risk and it didn't work. And, you know, obviously I had to live with it at the end of the day, but I mean, it's, it's, it's worst case scenario. That's what it is. That's what it comes down to. Like worst case scenario for our customers, not total worst case scenario for our customers, but like very bad for them. Very, very bad for us. Uh, very bad for Cameron. Like he's worked here and has been extremely loyal and worked exceptionally hard. Like, um, it's just not, uh, it's not who we are, how we like to operate, how we like to treat people. But it's like when there's outside factors, when you do everything within your reach and then even outside of your reach to try to do that too, it's just, it's really unfortunate. Well, uh, the other thing I think to add some additional context to the last 10 years, uh, I think from the outside looking in, a lot of people think that we have a huge team. Like the three of us sitting in this podcast have done everything top to bottom for the entire company from admin to financial, um, the financial portion or aspect to the business from product development to sales to marketing the e-com uh, like three guys so when you think about the dedication the sacrifice and the work ethic like it is unmatched between the three of us compared to any other industry brand period even looking looking outside the industry like what we've accomplished through great determination whatever you know whatever heartstring word you want to you want to use there um i'm proud of what we've done but i'm also extremely disappointed obviously in the current situation yeah and i think the so this is probably like getting into some of the issues uh, along the way here i mean we've worked with the same factory and done millions of dollars of work with a specific factory with one specific project manager this entire time. Now, nothing had ever been perfect along the way, just like any business relationship, but 
I mean, to what has happened recently or however long you want to go back in the calendar, like has been legitimately unethical. And I had said that you're lucky this is not the United States because what you're doing is criminal to us. And it is yeah, like it sabotage, is. espionage, like whatever, whatever you want to say, like we have been extorted. We have been lied to. We have been, I mean, you just go down the list. Right. Um, well, I think before we get there, before we get to that portion of the conversation, you know, going back 18 months ago, um, looking at the business, we were relatively flat as far as company growth, right? In the trail camera space for us to take the next step was to own the SaaS model, the recurring revenue in the opportunity to not only better the customer experience that they were having on Scout Tech, but to, for for also um, us to grow as a company, we needed to own we needed to own that part of the business, right? So we did our due diligence. We looked at what that opportunity cost has cost us over the course of 2018 to we'll call it 2022. So those four years of millions and millions of dollars going to third party Scout Tech, which is good for them for having the, the vision and the insight to, to add us as one of their vendors. But um, for us, we had to make that decision and say, hey, for us to grow, we need we need to have an app, we need to make that investment. And I think that's where not having a contingency plan and or and or the resources to have a contingency plan ultimately um, contributed to the situation, right? Um, so we made the decision to go ahead and release an app. You know, we sourced a fantastic vendor to actually work with us and do some of that work. And we get to a place where we have tens of thousands of existing connected devices out on the marketplace. And our plan strategically was to migrate those devices to create revenue from products that we've previously already sold. To accomplish that, a couple of things need to happen. Um, obviously, there's multiple SKUs. Inside of those three SKUs, which would be the render, the Rival A and the Rival A5, we had to alter the firmware for those three devices, which I'll try to explain this in a, the most straightforward fashion, but inside of that firmware, it doesn't necessarily change the function and operation of the camera. It's only changing how that camera is connected through AT commands and then where that camera is connected to, meaning the server infrastructure, the HTTPS calls made to upload those pictures you know, to a server and interact with the specific mobile app. Does that make sense? Is that clear enough, straightforward you're, sense? You're getting a little close to two engineering, but it, <laughs> okay, <laughs> everyone could follow that. <laughs> okay, um, and that's where the that's where the the, the problem started with, um, I guess we'll say the offshore manufacturing. So we go down the down the down the avenue of creating an app, knowing that we need to rewrite firmware that we've already paid for once. So during that project time frame, we had allocated about 16 months start to finish on that project. Uh, contractually, that was a 12 month agreement. And we get into the situation where our contract manufacturing development team, again, offshore, the folks who we've done business with for nine years, all of a sudden start to maybe give us the runaround a little bit, start to cause some delays in the project, um, and then prompted us to pay a second time for firmware that we've already paid for once. So knowing that we have hundreds of thousands of dollars invested into an app, we really don't have a, it's a, it, like, it's, it's not even a, a, a decision to think about. Yeah. yeah. But they have all the leverage. And, so, and they gave us option two to buy the firmware outright for six figures and correct everyone we had talked to is like, don't buy it because it's probably junk code. No one else is going to be able to work on it other than what they do. And you'd be better off to start from scratch. And right. the Which other cost us about $3 million. Right. And then, so out throughout that process, obviously we're trying to get the app ready and getting that, like we're all on this really tight timeline, which ties into another big avenue of this is the IOT contract. Correct. So in the midst of this, um, 
we have some production issues where cameras are built with a wrong piece of hardware. And again, several hundred thousand dollar mistake where in the, in the past nine years, the, the relationship with that contract manufacturer has never been perfect. They have um, produced things that have been wrong in the past, but there's always been some level of accountability there, which typically, you know, with our five-year warranty, they've held up to half of the liability um, in the product life cycle. And in this case where thousands of cameras were built wrong, they said, well, we're not going to do anything this time. But in our minds, they have all the leverage. The firmware is a, not having the firmware done is going to cost us multiple millions of dollars versus multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's just handle the products that were built wrong ourselves. So what that looks like is me physically working on thousands of cameras to get them working for customers like me as in me personally. So we go ahead and do that for leverage saying, Hey, we'll go ahead and eat the costs on these products. We'll fix them. We'll eat the labor costs. We'll eat all the logistics cost on this with the contingency of the firmware projects being done between these three SKUs, the render, the rival and the rival a five by, I think it was July 1st or June 1st in order for us to release the app um, and start the migration process before it's critical hunting season where folks need to use your cameras. And so, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but even before we got to the point where they made us pay twice, didn't they just one day just say the firmware team is done? Good point. Yeah. They just came to us one day and said, um, I know you guys have some firmware needs, but we no longer have a team that can do it. Correct. And that it's was in May, April. Yes, that's 10 months into the project after they are, had already accepted the project. And we were getting ready to release this app, and May 1st was the goal. May 1st and was the goal. In April, they tell us there's no firmware. There's no team. We don't have anyone here that can do it. Correct. And, and that was is, the reason they were giving us the runaround. They didn't just say that. Right. Which That's what I mean. Like, There's so much here to unpack. We've gone through so much over the last 18 months. There are probably bits and pieces and things that have happened that we're probably going to miss. And that's, sure. thank you for bringing that up, Cameron. Well, then, yeah. So then when we paid for that, we basically had to get the firmware moonlighted. And they would work on the weekends, only the weekends. We would all work remotely on the China's time, Asia's time. And then it would be, okay, this is what they got done. There's, all right, we're going to work both Saturday, Sunday. And then they just work Saturday. And then it just, there was no accountability or, or well, for about I, six weeks, it looked like, you know, I'd come in work 40 hours, work Friday, stay up all night, Friday, work with, work with the overseas team, do the same thing on Saturday. So I'm working 40, whatever, 40 hours straight, which is not, listen, that's not unusual for me personally, but I did that in a span of six continuous weeks to get firmware done for the project, which tied into the app being released August 1st or August 2nd versus July 1st or July 2nd. Like that's some of the, some of the causes of the delays there, but ultimately they got two out of the three SKUs on the firmware side, they got them, they got them correct. Like the rival a five firmware. Correct. They got the rival a firmware. Correct. And in the process of, uh, May 1st to August, I'll say we had been working on render items. Right. And, and we told them to work on the render first too, to begin with. Yeah. Yes, we had a contract requested that we had a contractual agreement that we had to have more Verizon products connected. And we've sold way more renders. So the priority was the render. What Correct. do they do first? The rival. Yes. Um, so yeah, they, the, they throw that debacle um, basically in our lap. But through the process of those months of working with firmware, we also brought in third-party engineers. Our IoT provider offered their multiple engineering expertise from several different um, POCs to help us troubleshoot the cause of the firmware problems. We've had quick tell engineers come in and identify 
problems within the firmware. QuickTiles is the module vendor that 99% of um, cellular trail cameras use. And then we also had Verizon engineers step in and troubleshoot. We've collectively identified what the problem was in August, relayed that to the firmware team, and they basically said, tough luck. And they abandoned the project, leaving us with really no options. I mean, the options are pay them more money for source code that we'd have to pay more money to complete, which obviously we didn't think um, made sense from a timeline perspective, because that's or, not something that's going to simplicity of the project too, because we had these engineers like it's four lines of code. I don't understand why they can't figure it out. You know, like look, this, that, and they all real. say, and they're all saying, what is going on? This like, doesn't even seem right. Like, like the, everyone's tinfoil hat was on top of their head at some point that became familiar with the project. Cause it was just like, this is just, it doesn't make sense because it's not like with how challenging, like how we're portraying this, it was a very easy fix based off yeah. the engineers. From the engineering side, it's it's the PDP sessions are timing out. Like the camera connects, there's context IDs around certain AT commands that essentially needed to be changed because wrong AT commands are being used, which is like the AT commands from a data sheet perspective, like they're documented and given to you to configure a module for certain certain connections and certain performances. So this isn't like we're asking folks to develop a new solution to a problem that's never existed like this is a documented process to follow that has been identified by several engineering teams and for whatever reason whether it's espionage dis distortion um or extortion they won't do it they've just completely abandoned the project i guess a question to answer would be um knowing that and Consu I, I know consumers have this question because they've brought it up. If right. we knew we had firmware issues, people may think that we should not have went forward with the project. And we made some of that decision making because the fix was that easy that it wasn't going to be a detrimental well, and, thing. And we tested the render a lot on the small scale render testing. We didn't experience issues. It didn't have these issues. And the well, other not thing, every camera has the issue is the thing. Correct. Like, yeah. It's a so, timing issue. Right. And so it's like, I don't want think, people to think that we pushed out this crappy product knowing that it was like we tested the firmware and it seemed to be okay. And then as you open the floodgates and we had been sending thousands and thousands and thousands of SIM cards and then it, some of those, it became much more apparent and then we're just working. Yeah. Pulling every single angle. Uh, yeah. I guess to Cameron's point and something that you brought up earlier, Jake, um, on the IOT side, the, for us to have connected devices, you have to commit to some type of forecast um, to have a expense structure to the product offering, which is, so, go ahead. Yeah. So basically like in layman's terms, we, we had a, for our app, we bought, we had a contract to buy bulk data from a, from a vendor. And then we have to forecast all that out. And so, you know, we, we had signed that commitment. <clears throat> you know, we had plans of releasing the app in May. So we had that commitment. We had to push it back a little bit. They were able to do that. And the commitment that we had suggested is obviously with all the cameras working properly, uh, not all these issues happening, having more uh, income or cash in order to buy more inventory. Like, as you guys know, like we wanted to launch the rival ver Verizon version this year. Um, and so like all that didn't happen. So then we were just way low on the connected devices because our manufacturer wouldn't fix the issue that should have been. Right. Which leads into missing those forecasts or minimum, minimum spend projections and literally us eating tens of thousands of dollars just every month, throwing cash out the month or out the door every single month. And again, I'm not sure how much we want to unpack here, but we were blood dry. <laughs> like that's you have, you have what our, could have been our recurring revenue to help float us to go along. And we had discussed to renegotiate that earlier and we remained exceptionally persistent on that. And the long and short of it is like, they're a giant company and 
we were a smaller, we, I think we were described as a small to mid, mid-sized company. mid size, I think is what they typically used. And our mid-sized business was killed. <laughs> uh, what honestly like felt like a sacrificial lamb for their business, whether that's right or wrong or incorrect, but that's like, that's my perception. And then, and you would ask, uh, very specific questions and not get very specific answers of like, okay, uh, this is a, and to add clarity, a lot of the people there had been actually excellent to work with. Um, but anytime you're in a larger corporation or a business that, you know, obviously those guys don't have the decision-making power, but long short is like, we were blood dry and it accelerated the position that we're in because of the firmware. And like, we're not, we can't, we can't burn 50 grand a month of cash when we have issues with our firmware, we have issues with our manufacturers and this new app is supposed to be helpful for us. And as is negative, negative revenue, even though we produce revenue on it. And while we're going through that, we have nothing to sell. Correct. Right. Because the, the production was given to us wrong. And Chad has now have to hand fix. And that part that was wrong was the size of a speck of sand. Like it would take uh, an American worker. It was like 10 minutes per took, device. It took me eight minutes per device to fix each one. Which is, I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of cameras that need to be fixed. Right. So while we're dealing with all of the like bleeding money, we have nothing to sell to create more revenue to um, support that. Right. I think there's, there's two things I will, I, want to add here is a recap of everything that we just kind of talked about. And then two, like in my mind, if I was listening to this podcast, it's like, well, why wouldn't you take legal action against the offshore team that's causing all these problems? So I want I want to touch base on two of those things, but so what we have is an investment in this app, hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, as a, a liability with products that were built wrong. We've had to pay for firmware twice at this point. We've had, um, firmware abandoned because of the firm, firmware team dissolving. Um, we've had those delays. And then on top of that, we are in production with mm. a standard SD card camera that we have essentially we've paid for that. Again, we're built out of spec at this point. We're not delivering products to a customer that are built out of spec and the company that we've done business with for 10 years and built, spend millions of dollars with essentially has taken our money without delivering us a product. And they said, you could take them or leave them. So and, like, yeah, for sure. And the other thing too, to bring up with this, like, well, um, did you have someone go over there? Did you hire, like we hired a consultant that is extremely in tune with overseas manufacturing speaks fluent Mandarin. And he called the owner of the factory. He, like he would, he would pester them beyond belief. And even he said, like, "What's going on over there?" Because like, and that's like, people are like, "Well, could you done this? Could you done that? Could you done this?" Like, we've talked to ex exceptionally smart people that have been in similar positions that we're in. And you know what they typically say? I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. <laughs> because in other words, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, and again, that's like one of the finite points that we probably glazed over that. You know, there's so much to unpack here, but a, that liaison was the initial reason that we were able to get something done back in True. May and June. Like True. they were the he was responsible for jump starting that conversation and reigniting the project essentially after we had already paid for it once. They dissolved their firmware team. Um and we were able to essentially pay for it a second time and make some progress out of two of the three SKUs. Um but then from I guess uh, somebody listening to this podcast is like, well, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you just take legal action against them, against that offshore team, sue them, try to get some of your money back or all of it back and proceed with business. And again, we've exhausted every single effort um, or all efforts that have come to mind or have been um, recommended to us. And, with that, obviously, legal counsel is a big, a big part. But legal, our legal advice or our legal counsel basically said, like, we're, you're, 
we're basically stuck. You need to hire, you can hire us as a firm, which in turn, we need to hire a larger firm that has local jurisdiction, which means, hey, we're gonna have to go find somebody that has jurisdiction in Shenzhen to help fight this. You're gonna be tied up for months and months and months and months. The legal fees are going to be probably close to the value of what you're suing for, but there's no guarantee that the outcome is going to be in your favor. And more than likely, it's not going to be in your favor due to the structure of Chinese business culture. Mm -hmm. Are you, like you're essentially trying to fight the CCP. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think the other thing too is we have been operating exceptionally lean as well before this throughout this process i mean bare bones like as lean as possible to try to weather whatever whatever storm was going to come and so like this isn't something that completely blindsided us like we were trying to do everything to brace ourselves for a storm but it was a freaking category five hurricane and <laughs> we thought it'd be maybe a category two or something like that just to like the magnitude of what has happened has been so massive if it, we, was a, if it was one of those things, we'd overcome each one individually. But it seemed like from, I don't know, April of 23 to now, if it could have went wrong, it went wrong. Like yeah. there was no small victories inside of those. Like the contract to, um, the contract with the app was a 12 month contract from, April to April. Our release date's May 1st. Well, December comes and like they haven't even started working on the infrastructure of the app. So you're already behind the eight ball there. So you, you start with a uh, shrunk testing. Like there's You're not left with a whole bunch of time to test. And then you combat that with firmware issues with the lack of a firmware team to get anything for the app or you just have all those things happening in a string that if they would happen individually, you'd be able to overcome them and we would have overcame, overcame them, but it just was too many hurdles. There was a mountain to climb and our bike was broken. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing too of this is we're not passing the buck or like blaming. I mean, We've done, I mean, I can wholeheartedly say we've done absolutely everything possible that we could have done within our power, within our resources, within our reach, and trying to bring in whatever we could to try to get it to have a different outcome. And that's where it's like, I don't think, obviously you guys don't know us that well. You just listen to the podcast or maybe this first podcast you ever listen to. Like, I feel like we're all pretty darn like, get it done. No excuse. If you screw up, it's your own fault. Learn from it. Move on. And like, that's my perspective of it. And it's like, at, as it sits today, like it absolutely sucks. That's not even a good way to describe it, but like, I feel like we've done absolutely everything we could within our power, within our resources, within our team. Yeah, no, I, everybody here takes the extreme ownership approach to running a business to their daily tasks or jobs. And in fact, every employee that we've ever brought on, it's been a requirement for them to read that book in the first 30 days of their employment opportunity. So it's not, this isn't us passing the buck. It's trying to communicate the, the challenges um, that ultimately forced us, forced our hand in dissolving the company. And I think along too, cause I know we had to communicate with a lot of customers, like probably in September when there was some experience, some issues with the render, <clears throat> we were really thought we were a week away from getting that fixed. And then like, we would push back another week. Like we really feel like they told us, they're working on it. It's going to be done in a week. And so we're, we're just the liaison of passing that along to where they're at any point. Like, I know I didn't lie to anyone. Like what I told you was truthful to my knowledge and what like, and that's where we get to a point too, where it's like, as things have progressed, like we don't know what to communicate. And that's why we've been quiet because we don't want to lie to you. We don't want to give you false hope. And like, and it, it's just really tough because, and then throughout this period too, like we had talked to, everyone to try to do a merger, try to do an acquisition, try to get a, a dilution of equity, like try to fix the problems. Like, cause we do, we had built a good business. We had built a good brand, but like 
just a compound snowball snowball of issues all came to a head at once. And so like throughout that period, we were trying to fix the bigger picture, cash infusion, whatever the case may be. And this ultimately fell up short. And once again, not to, not to a lack of effort. I mean, I, I don't know many, how, how many hours I was on the phone this year with whoever all the time trying to a figure lot. it out, answering their questions. Uh, explaining to them, not not telling them the truth, like, hey, we're in a really tough spot. This is not like just being completely transparent. And it just didn't happen. And I think that ultimately that probably tied into some customer experience frustrations too, because we're, again, to your point, operating bare bones, four or five guys here. Um, and people throughout the 10 years of, of running Exodus, people, I think, Collectively, because we want wanted the customer experience to be top notch, and we took so much responsibility for that that we often made ourselves overly accessible to fix customer problems. I know I can speak on that. Cameron can speak on that. Jake, you can speak on that. Um, where people are used to being like, "Hey, if I have a problem, I could probably get in touch with Chad." But there was a point in all of this, and I'm going to say over the last probably the three months when. Like we were scrambling to solve bigger picture problems and could not physically impossible touch everybody in the same manner that we have over the last 10 years, because knowingly, Hey, if, if our attention right now is on the, on the short term or nearsighted problems of fixing a customer issue, we're not solving the big or the efforts aren't going towards solving the big picture items. And this thing is, you know, we're not going to have any options. Um, at the end of this. So like from that perspective, it wasn't the last three months has not been, Hey, let's ignore customers. It's, we don't have the bandwidth for the three of us to touch all of our customers because we're busy trying to solve the bigger picture problems so we can continue business to hopefully resolve those customer experience issues long-term. Yeah. Which in the, at that same point, like, why didn't you guys just tell us that, that we, you know, it, it's like at that rate, you know, I felt it just, it's a tough thing to communicate in general. And every time that we were in the position, we were like, we found out that the render problems were happening small scale and then it continued to grow as we got more devices connected Then it continued to grow as we got more devices connected. At first we were like, there's not a huge issue. There's a small issue that we're going to get fixed. So there's really nothing to address. We'll work through it and we'll get them fixed. Then it became, okay, this is a little bit larger scale. Now all efforts have to go towards fixing the firmware, working with the team that abandoned us. And then you get to a point where you're like, okay, you have an issue that we are aware of and we're working so hard to fix. People are like, just tell us what's going on. It was hard to put into words what was going on because every day we thought, oh, tomorrow to be fixed, tomorrow to be fixed tomorrow to be fixed. So you put so out a statement yeah. or you send out a mass email or whatever to affected customers. And then the next day it's fixed. So you just caused unnecessary chaos within my cameras aren't going to be working. People are having issues. I should have never switched. And we were like, well, tomorrow it's going to be fixed. They're going to, they're going to have us a resolution tomorrow. And then every week would go by like still no firmware, still no firmware. And something to touch on too was with the render we have never had to have two firmwares for the same product. And throughout the, the testing phase, we're like, we have some cameras that will connect and we have some cameras that won't connect. And I remember going down every possible thing. I was like looking at all these cameras. I'm like, okay, we have 20 cameras here that are connected. They're all MCU X or firmware version X. We have... 20 of these cameras that won't. And then we go to the people responsible for it and they're like, oh, well, we must need to have different firmware because there's different modules inside the camera. The people giving us the product didn't even know what they were giving us a code for. Yeah, there's some engineering complexity there with system SOCs, like system on chips, where there's embedded firmware on certain pieces of hardware right and there was a compatibility issue within module configuration because the embedded firmware on one module version 
um, was different than another module version that was used in production, which again, has never been a problem um, throughout a product that had a six year life cycle until we needed to change the APN and change the HTTPS server information. I guess my point in bringing that up too is it wasn't our intention to do that and to delay people being able to connect their devices. It was a problem that came up. that came to a head really quick as we were launching. Correct. So we had a lot of people were like, just tell us when the next firmware is going to be ready. When's the 14 going to be ready? When's the 14 M4G going to be ready? And at one point, like we didn't know. True. Um, I mean, what other snap? I mean, this could be a 10 hour podcast of lessons learned, but I mean, like in terms of other things that I think are really important to communicate to customers, I think, I mean, a heartfelt apology. Sorry. I mean, th like at the end of the day, I mean, I go, I'm sorry for how things have happened. A lot of this is out of our control. We did absolutely everything we could. I know if I was a customer, I would have had frustration. And so yeah. for that, I apologize. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to put into words an appropriate message in, to deliver an apology. And I'm not sure I can put into the words the weight that, has, that I have felt over the last... Weight of the world, man. Three months. Well, I think it goes beyond that, right? For, for me personally. Um, I look at this brand and from a selfish perspective, I guess, I look at obviously the sacrifices that I've made. But the thing that weighs on me more is the sacrifices that other people have made to make, to allow me to have the opportunity or allow us the opportunity to, to, to have Exodus, to build Exodus. And that includes my family sacrificing, um, both of you guys sacrificing professionally um, from like a financial standpoint, because all three of us could go get better job, better paying jobs doing something else. But it has been our passion and our mission to create this brand. And we've all sacrificed on the forefront of that. But then you have all the people that have touched, touched the brand from a partner or um, uh, a collaboration standpoint, like, some of those folks have sacrificed and, and ultimately like all of our, all of our customers, like I guess three months ago, I did not want to accept the fact that this was going to, we we're going to end up in this position because I felt like once I, we, I personally made that acceptance, like it was quitting. And like, to me, like it's never been an option. Quitting this has never been an option. Right. And the weight of that bared down enough where, had some health issues going on, like not to play into the, uh, I, I don't know, like to make people feel sorry for the three of us. Cause that's not what this is, but I'm just trying to communicate the weight that this has on the three of us is hard to put into words in the form of a genuine apology that that weight shines through in. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that we can put it into words. That's a good, really good way to put it because it is really tough. And I just, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think of all the people that bought cameras that believed in what we we're doing and, you know, like they spent their hard earned money to buy what we've done. And it, it's, I don't know. I feel that like to my core and it is ex exceptionally, exceptionally hard to come to grips with. I mean, I, I don't think like throughout this process, I mean, throughout this process, we thought things were, going to be done but then like there's still a possible lead and i'm pounding it down like trying to make it happen okay well that one's done okay go to the next one just keep trying absolutely every single thing possible to make and that's it happen. Tr that's true right now as we record this podcast don't check your phone <laughs> i have it on airplane mode okay uh not to <laughs> not, not to damper the mood anymore <laughs> I always think back to the story video we did in, was that two years ago? 
um, where Chad had a line in it that struck how much you guys put into Exodus and what it meant to you guys and the products that we were developing. Um, Chad said, you're not just giving us your dollars. You're sacrificing your time for these products that we're making you. And we always took that approach that we never took it for granted. We never took um, the customer experience. Like it, it seems like with a lot of companies and brands and interactions you have, um, you're just a customer and you're going to come and go. And we never took that approach. Like there are people that were fulfilling orders that like you could call up by name and say, Hey man, your, your camera's coming to you or hey your your arrows are ready or hey last time you bought arrows you ordered this this time do you want this or this may be better for you and we always took that approach that it's not just a dollar coming to us it's somebody's time so we should return that and um so that like the customer experience and how we felt about everyone that supported us and stuck through us because i mean look at the track record of our product releases or pre-sales that haven't gone the way we wanted them to go. And everyone stuck with us to yeah. get us to the release of an app, which could have been a really, I mean, the excitement level in July, Ju well, June, May, when we were going to get this thing going, like the excitement of what was to come was at the very top, the very highest you could be and then when you get into august september october to the very low like the people that we were impacting it wasn't something that we could just say well which it's not gonna work out we just we never took it that way mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah absolutely i agree with that and it's it's been a emotional roller coaster and probably a physical roller coaster in real in all reality of just uh fighting with every last ounce possible in order to avoid this podcast like i have dreaded this i'm sure you guys have dreaded this because it's 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 a failure at the end of the day like at the end of the day it failed we failed our customers we like it just didn't work out and throughout this year it's been pretty interesting like I inherently just talk to a lot of different people, whether they're customers, wherever the case may be, like a bunch of different people. And throughout this year, I've had like three people distinctly, like people I don't even know, right? Like first conversation on the phone or you run into them and they're familiar with what we're doing and everything else. And they just said like, yeah, you know, I had this one business and it failed. And he says, you know, easy to say now, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And through earlier in this year, I was like, that's weird. That's weird. People just like, I don't even know that. Why are they telling me their life story <laughs> type deal? And then like throughout this process, that's been something that has been in the back of my head of not wanting a, to accept that we're, where we're at where we are today. But I mean, it's like when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard to look forward of what does the future look like? Cause this has been our lives. This is a hundred percent been our lives. We've all sacrificed so much, uh, from a family perspective, time perspective, like the business has always came first, always, absolutely. No matter what. And it's tough to like put in your all and it not work out. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can add anything to that, but yeah. Um, we had a handful of different notes here and I mean, what I mean, I, I, I at this point, like a heartfelt, a heartfelt, thank you. And apology, I think is what we were trying to communicate there. Um, which again, it's hard to put into words, but I think that we need to cover how the end user is going to be impacted, what it means for connective devices, et cetera. Yeah. So I mean, feel free to tackle that. I know I talked really briefly in the beginning of what the next steps are for end users. Uh, if you're currently wondering why your camera stops sending pictures, um, they're not going to send pictures again. So this is what you have to do moving forward. So what's, what are those next steps? Um, if you still have cameras on the Exodus app, the first thing to do is disable the auto renew. So you're not going to be continually billed in any capacity. If you are, uh, over the next week or so, there will be 
appropriate refunds issued to any cameras that are currently shut off. Um, but in the immediate future, nearsighted, if you, all the cameras can be reverted back to Scout Tech, as Jake had mentioned, it will be, I guess, uh, another migration process for you, which we totally understand. At this point, like you're probably fed up with that migration process. You probably just want to bury the hatchet and move on from the entire experience. I, I get it. Um, but also knowing like you, you probably still have working camera inventory that is still valuable. It can be reverted back to scout tech, which would include reverting the firmware back to um, a previous version and updating the SIM card for use on scout tech. What's the step-by-step -step process for people to go on the app? Cause I'm so sure someone's going to open up the app right now to disable that auto renew. You just go to the um, device management device details, disable auto renew. And you have to do that individually for each camera. So if you, there's device management, there's data plan management. Um, there's the individual device. There's a bunch of different ways to get to the device details page, but you need to find yourself on the device details page check disable auto renew yeah deleting your account using the equipment return button that is not that's not tied to billing so if you just go in and just say i'm done with this i'm going to delete my account that's not disabling the billing portion of the connected device to the payment processor so as cameron mentioned you have to use that disable auto renew feature found on the device detail page I think one potential challenge folks might have um, with switching to Scout Tech, switching back to Scout Tech, that um, you may have to do some additional legwork. If you never cleared or mm. deleted the device off of Scout Tech, when you go to register that camera again, it's going to tell you that it's already registered. So you're going to have to contact Scout Tech to have it cleared. Um, I've ha we've had people run into that already, and they ask us like. You have to delete it from your software. It says it's already registered. But Scout Tech's platform and the Exodus platform don't communicate. They don't know that the camera is on either one of them. So if it tells you in Scout Tech that it's already registered, that means it already is registered in Scout Tech. So you'll have to contact them to have them clear that for you to um, put it back on there. And we've communicated some of this to Scout Wayne and the Scout Tech team. Um, so they're loosely aware of the situation and have a process for folks who they've already migrated folks back to scout tech. So they have an established process there that you can be walked through. Yep. Support, and, support at scout tech.com. Tell them what you need. And then they send a, basically a, a link to download the firmwares and do the whole process there. And you'll get SIM cards just like we sent out SIM cards and the SIM cards are the same size. Um, I mean, the other, the, uh, like wait, what's on the website's on the website. Everything's marked down. I mean, that's what we have is everything's for sale. Yeah. Um, 4k orders are going to be continued to be refunded. We've been doing that over the last, I don't know, a handful of two weeks or whatever. Um, but with the finality of the situation as it sits today, uh, we'll continue we'll continue to refund those orders. Um, but December 31st Exodus, as we know it, as you all know, it will be officially dissolved. Anything else here? I mean, that's like I said, this could have been a, a much longer podcast. I would encourage anyone that wants to start a business. Don't let this be the, be discouraging, but I'll tell you this. I will, I don't ever want to deal with overseas manufacturing again. And I think the other maybe misunderstood or a different perception is like, none of us have come with a, with a additional cash to throw into this business. And a lot of businesses in this space, um, you know, like they have another successful business and they really like the outdoor industry. So they develop a product and they're able to float some of these issues. Like we simply weren't able to do that. And I think that, you know, like some, there's a variety of key lessons that I've learned throughout the years and I would be a really apprehensive to start a project overseas. It's just, it, and, and it's, and it's different for every product too. Like it's a connected device, right? 
it's a it's a camera you put on a tree that sends pictures to your phone like it's a pretty complicated product so maybe it wouldn't be as bad but i'll tell you this i will always prioritize to buy and support usa made and manufactured goods um because i firmly believe what what happened is unethical unfair and at the end of the day we can whine whine fuss and cry about it but it's what happened and but it changed my consumer behavior absolutely yeah mine as well yeah well, um, no sense to drag this out. I mean, just once again, I want to reiterate, apologize with, we did the best we could. We, the lack of communication was not from lack of caring. It was quite the opposite of working exceptionally hard to avoid this podcast. And um, just want to thank everyone and really appreciate everything throughout the years, all the kind words, all the people tuning into the podcast, people sharing their success, all the people we've been able to meet through this platform. Um, like I don't take any of that for granted and uh, it's a small consolation of, of what's happened here, but I really do appreciate everyone throughout this entire process, even if it was constructive criticism. Uh, <laughs> it's really easy to do behind a keyboard, but there's been people that have uh, made a point to pick up the phone and, and share what they ha ha had to share, you know, like even good, good and bad things in regards to the content in regards to the arrows in regards to the cameras. Like, I feel like we truly built a really tight knit community within our brand um, at scale, which was at scale because of the content, but not at scale on our, on our behalf, like as the business grow, grew, so did our responsibilities and the amount of people that we would uh, communicate with. Yeah. And uh, again, just to reiterate the, the, the couple points that we made on the podcast, this isn't the finality of this situation. Isn't us pointing the finger at anybody. Like ultimately the failure falls on my shoulders, right? As the, titled or untitled leader of what we've done over the last decade um in some way i fell short in making correct decisions along the way over the last 18 months um it's just hard hard to put into words i guess i, I would ask all you guys to give one one key piece of advice for someone that is wanting to start their own company or maybe has a small company of like uh it's a, they always say like uh failures are the best lessons and we've learned a lot um and it's hard to probably boil it down into one thing but i mean i, I would just be curious i feel like i'd be curious what your guys perspective would be on just a sage piece of advice for for someone that has a dream has whatever because like this was our dream right and uh, I think that I just don't want to discourage other people because there's businesses that do grow and work and there's a lot of them that end up like exactly where we're at too. Um, my advice, again, it's probably the context around it is tied to a product company, but having ultimately like there's a lot of lessons, right? But a, a lot of those lessons that we, and the hardships that we were able to overcome that turned into lessons tied back to having proper resources to to scale. And in this situation, the finality of this decision uh, or situation is tied to not being able to overcome obviously financial barriers. So having the proper capital to fund resources to, to expand on a team, I think is, is one lesson. And then two, there's probably, I mentioned this earlier, but sometimes you do need a couple lucky bounces and like, you can't go into a situation thinking, well, I'm smarter. I work harder. Like that's enough to drive success. At, at the end of the day, like this is living proof that that doesn't always that that plan isn't good enough. I would say um, for me, not being an owner, but being in the position that I have been able to be in with Exodus, there are thousands of people that want to be in my shoes. Well, maybe not today, but <laughs> um, previously where I was at, there were a lot of people that wanted to be in my shoes. And if I had any advice to people younger than me, older than me that have that dream, um, goals and, uh, your hope or your want to do something mean absolutely nothing if you don't work towards it. So it's never going to just show up in your lap. You have to take a risk and, um, 
I see so many people and you hear people talk about all the time, like nothing good ever happened without taking a pretty big risk. And we all got here by taking huge risks. Chad starting the business in his garage, not getting paid for years. I left um, a five-year accounting degree, making a lot of money to come work in a dungeon for $10 an hour. (laughs) Um, Like if you want to get, somewhere you want to start a business saying that you want to start the business means nothing at all until you take the first step forward to doing it and once you take the first step you're going to say okay one step one foot in front of the other take minimal minimal steps towards it and um it'll start coming into place but it's never going to happen if you don't try it's good 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 piece of advice there (laughs) well yeah I don't know what I don't know what happens with the podcast. I don't know what happens with the YouTube. Like all, so there's still some things that are still up in the air. Um, but in terms of like Exodus operating as a product company is com- coming to a close. So I think I think we've covered everything that we should cover, unless there's something else that you guys can think of. No, just sorry, um, sorry for everyone that had maybe missed an opportunity on a deer this year because their cameras weren't functioning properly. Um, And thank you for believing in us as long as you did. 